from system breaches, but also because we find individuals give out their passwords, either in email, they put it on a post-it note, or to someone over the phone. The Verizon report also highlights that individuals use the same passwords on many systems. So once a password is compromised, it's easy for a bad actor to then try and use that password on another system. The third one is misdelivery. This occurs when information is sent to the wrong party. This happens very easily with email. So for example, my boss's name is Mike. How many Mikes do you have in your company? How many do you have in your contact list? Have you ever sent information to the wrong one? If you use Outlook as your email platform, there are tools within it that you can enable that will show your employees if they are sending an email to an outside party or if they're receiving one from an outside party that may help them detect malicious emails or stop them from making a mistake by sending an email to the wrong party. This can be found in the mail tips section of Outlook. The fourth and final one that we'll cover is misconfiguration. And this occurs when someone makes an error in configuring a server or another IT asset. When creating your firewall rules, as an example, what review and authorization procedure is followed? Do you have routine audits to check the configuration? And for me, what stands out and why we really included this chart in this presentation is to show that although they're tied to technology, most of these are caused by human errors. So we can't emphasize enough that a company with even the best technology in place is still vulnerable. We strongly encourage each company to provide information security training for your employees at least annually and include sending phishing emails to your employees as part of that. We found that you can you know, have classroom setting training, you can send out white papers, but unless you actually test your employees, it's hard to know how they'll respond to a phishing email when they receive one. So by purchasing a tool or working with a third party to send phishing emails to your employees, you can find the areas that you need to focus on to help your employees learn how to spot phishing emails and not fall victim. So in addition to the Verizon report, we also grabbed a few stats that we thought would be relevant to this group. The first one comes from the FBI which states that cybercrime led to three and a half billion in losses in the United States in 2019. And then the average cost of a ransomware attack on a business is $133,000. And we lose over 17,000 every minute due to phishing attacks. Can your company afford to be a victim? I'll pause here to see if there are any questions No questions, Megan. Great, thank you, Andrew. Next, we'll move into SolarWinds. We won't get into the technical details, but we felt it was important to mention this because it was recently in the news. And it's probably one of the most impactful attacks in recent history. So in mid-December, SolarWinds announced that hackers had inserted malware into a software update that they then in turn pushed out to over 18,000 of their customers. SolarWinds is a company used by many different companies in different industries, including the government, to monitor their own network activity. As mentioned, this is one of the most significant and impactful hacks in recent history because it attacked the supply chain, where it took a regular update from a company that's trusted and turned it into a gateway for a bad actor to get into the company. The impact is still being investigated and is not known at this time. This attack really highlights each company's patching process. Previously, many companies just patched their systems based on a vendor update and thought they were all set. Now the question is, what do you need to do when you receive one? Do you need to change your vendor management program to test every patch before it comes into your environment? These are some of the questions that you'd wanna ask your team and then also, were you aware of SolarWinds? How are you notified of these types of events? And what notifications do you receive from your vendors? While the SolarWinds impact is still unknown, we do have some examples of cyber scams that have actually impacted our customers over the years. So first I'll start with giving an example. 
example from our consumer side. They have fallen, unfortunately, for online dating scams, inheritance scams, IRS scams, and Microsoft scams. I'll just give one example. We worked with a customer that received an email stating that a long lost cousin died in Turkey and he was going to receive an inheritance of $12 million. In order to process it, the person that contacted him said they would need about $4,000 to process legal fees. Our customer sent $4,000 and the person claims they filed it incorrectly, so they needed another $4,000 to file the paperwork in Turkey. Our customer was adamant that this was legitimate because they looked at the U.S. Embassy website for Turkey and the person's name was listed. Unfortunately, our customer kept sending money to the person that contacted him by email and sent a total of $140,000 before realizing it was a scam. And we cannot state enough that it is extremely important to verify all transactions and that although email is an easy communication tool and the internet is helpful for searches, they are not legal documents and should not be relied on for any type of transaction. Andrew, is there a question? Yeah, there's a question. Uh, is there insurance that would help me in the event that I'm the victim of a cyber attack? Great question. We receive questions about types of insurance all the time, and we would recommend that you work with your insurance agents. There are different types of cyber insurance um, policies, but there's also other policies that cover it because, again, most of the time, if someone sends out a fraudulent transaction, it wouldn't be covered by your cyber policy. It might be covered by another policy you already have. So we recommend that you speak with your insurance agent to understand what you're currently covered for and what other additional insurance policies you could do um, and purchase to help protect your company. Okay, Andrew, any other questions? Yes, there's one more. Will the bank cover me if I'm a victim of a cyber scam and money is taken from my account? Thanks, Andrew. That's another very common question. And unfortunately, it does depend on every situation. One thing I will mention is that there is a misconception that FDIC insurance covers cybercrime, and that is not true. Um, so it really depends on the situation, and we would work with our customers to see what happened and how it's covered but it's really on a case by case basis, depending on how the transaction was initiated um, for that fraud. And again, there are regulations that cover certain transactions. So again, it's just very dependent on the situation. Andrew, any other questions? No other questions. Okay, thanks. Then this is a good time to hand it over to John. John will now provide a few examples of recent scams that have impacted our business customers. John? Well, thank you, Megan. Uh, and sort of just to pick up on what Megan was saying, when you look at business customers, the dynamic shifts with two more, uh, two more potential downsides in, in terms of fraud. One is companies usually tend to keep more cash on hand for operating needs. So the target is larger. And then the other part is when a company reaches a certain size, you then have to have other people beside the, scan, the uh, signers on the account being able to access the account. So you add a little more complexity. And we're gonna cover that uh, in the next couple of minutes. So some of the cyber incidents that we've, uh, we've seen and, and the most egregious, if you will, have been account payable transactions. And these are transactions where customers will send out money thinking they're paying a vendor in the routine course of business. And unfortunately, these are, these are quite large. And actually, if you look at some of the numbers involved here, you know, from 119,000 to a quarter of a million to almost a million dollars are quite significant. And quite candidly, most companies could not afford a hit of that size. So this is something that we've seen, we work very hard and, and very quickly with our customers to try to prevent, uh, but we do wanna make people aware that they're out there and we're gonna cover these type of incidents later in the presentation. 
Another piggybacking on that is HR payroll fraud, where an employee will send an email saying, hey, I've changed bank accounts. Can you send my pay to this, you know, to this account rather than my old account? And some of them can be quite compelling. Uh, and then finally, the other category would be ransomware. And ransomware is where you get a hack where it shuts down your system and you get an email saying, I want payment of X, usually in Bitcoin, uh, if you want access to all of your information. Uh, and that's sort of, to our, we're talk a little about backing up your information in case something like this were to hit. So those are the three major ones that I'm gonna, you know, sort of cover. Uh, so if we move on to like, you know, how to prevent it, a lot of times what we get, you know, on the, on the next slide is, you know, how do we prevent a cyber incident? And, and a lot of people ask me, what's the one thing I can do to help prevent a cyber incident? Unfortunately, uh, it's very analogous to saying, what's the one thing I can do to prevent getting in an accident? There isn't anything you can do to prevent it. But what you can do is you can minimize the chances of getting in an accident by being an attentive driver, not talking on the phone while you're driving, pay attention to the road. But then you also want to wear seatbelts just in case you get hit by someone else and then have good insurance to be able to you know, protect you uh, on the downside. So the idea is that you know, although you can't prevent it, you can take mitigants to help prevent you getting hit so minimize the chances of you getting in that accident, okay? And then having a backup plan in case it were to happen. So what I would say is you wanna have a sense of humility. We like to think, particularly on the internet, of criminals as being dumb, uh, you know, the, the dumb criminal or, you know, should have seen that coming. I've seen some of these incidents that have come through and these are very sophisticated criminals. Quite candidly, if uh, I, I believe if they put their, uh, efforts to good, we would all be vaccinated and be going on our merry way. But these are very intelligent people, some of which, if you look in the press, are state actors. So they're resourceful, they're intelligent, and they need to be respected. So when you think about it, it, it is a risk that you have to, you know, be concerned about and be prepared to take some mitigating, mitigating actions. Uh, not only to be aware of that it could happen, what could I do to minimize the chance? And if I were hacked, what could I do about it? So let's talk about what you can do to help minimize the chances of you being a, a victim of a cyber incident. First one, and the easiest thing to do, and this is sort of good, you know, this is the pay attention while you're driving uh, thing that you can do, is review your accounts on a daily basis. On a daily basis, get into the discipline of looking at what transactions have posted to your account uh, the day before. The faster we are aware that you've been hacked, A, we can help get the money back potentially, uh, and B, you're also, we'll also put the account on lockdown so that we're aware that there is a problem going on. So the first thing in, in the first line of defense is knowing what's going through on your account. Unfortunately, we've gotten calls where, you know, a check has cleared, you know, or a item has cleared my account that's six months to a year old. Well, at that point, there's not a lot we can do about that. The sooner we're made aware of it, the better we can respond to that type of incident. Second one is access control. And what we mean by access control is who needs access to the account? And what are their needs to be able to transact business on behalf of your account? So when you set up an account, you will have users online typically. What you want to think through is why does a person need access to it? And what controls can I put around that person so that they only see the information that they need to see to be able to do their job properly? Uh, the bank is actually right now going through an exercise as we're looking at users that haven't used their account uh, in a while. And we're reaching out saying, hey, you know, do you still, does this user still need access? So the, a lot of them have never signed on in about, a, a, in about a year. And we're finding one of two things are either happening. Either they shouldn't have been granted access to begin with, or they're no longer with the organization. A uh, point to take away from this is, you know, as part of the separation procedure you have with employees, if they have long 
if they have access to online banking, make sure that you remove that access on the system. It's very important because obviously you don't want ex-employees to have access to your bank account. And it's very easy to do, okay? And forget about that as in terms of a checklist. But if you add that to a checklist as part of your procedure, you'll be better protected. And then finally, review the transactions that go through the accounts. Uh, we've had many instances, for example, where someone reconciling the account, uh, if let's say there is an American ex corporate American Express relationship, uh, we've had situations where employees will pay their American Express bill you know, on the company because it'll show American Express on the statement. So having the control of understanding not only is the transaction, but what does that transaction represent? So it's a spot check of knowing what goes on. Now, if you're like, I started in banking in 1980, <laughs> 1983, and it was drilled into us, what we want to do is we want to have paper backup, you know, for, for records. So if you remember a flop, what a floppy disk was for, like I do, okay, it's time to sort of, sort of rethink the way you, you understand keeping paper files. Storage right now is cheap. Uh, and there are a lot of solutions in the cloud that you may want to think about, do I really need that paper? Because when you think about paper, it has to be kept somewhere that's secure. Uh, you have to keep an eye of how long do you really need it around? And then how do you destroy that? And here at Enterprise, we have spread days where, you know, some of our branches will, it will contract with a third party shredder that'll help take some of that bulk stuff out. But the question becomes is, do you really need that documents to begin with? Uh, so I sort of challenge everyone is sort of look at the option of electronic statements. The ability to electronically deliver those statements that can be tailored to the users that actually need the information. And if your auditor comes, you're able to print that off and to provide your auditor a copy of that statement. Uh, the question becomes is if they're paper statements there is actual additional vulnerability. Uh, and why do you wanna have that vulnerability if it's not truly important? So, so when we talk John, about prevent- John, we have, a, we have a question. Is this a good time? Yes, please, yes. Okay. Can I set up alerts to tell me when certain types of transactions hit my account or if it changes are made to my account? Yes, you can. And, and actually, that, that's a good question. Uh, we've at, we, the bank is constantly uh, innovating in terms of the products and services that we have. And we do have an alert module that allows you to tailor different types of alerts. Uh, so it'll let you not only know, you know when a change is made, but also with an audit log, you can also look at what users are doing while they're in the system. So yes, there's ability to set up alert, uh, alerts. Good questions. Megan, any, any, you want to add to that? Yes, I'd like to. I'd actually like to jump back to a question I was asked earlier about the liability on the bank, um, and it ties into the examples you were giving. Um, we want to be clear, you know, one of the most recent ones we worked on was a customer that processed an ACH based on an email they received. So as long as the customer has gone in and authorized the transaction, if it turns out later to be fraudulent, that is the customer's loss. So we really recommend that you do not process anything based on email. It's extremely important to call someone and make sure it's an actual transaction that should be processed. This does happen, as John said, mostly with accounts payable. It can happen if you're a third party processor. It gets very tricky because email is quick and it's easy. But unfortunately, if you as a business customer authorize a wire or authorize an ACH, as soon as those funds are gone, we cannot recover them automatically. We do our best to help and assist, but once the money leaves the bank, we no longer and you no longer have any rights to it. So we wanna be very clear in those situations for business customers, if you have authorized an ACH or a wire transaction, that would be the customer's loss. All right, thanks, John. Thank you, and I kinda of wanna pick up on that as well. Uh, there's been a, a shift in terms of the type of fraud that we're seeing, particularly by email. When we think about the, you know, I, I won the Australian lottery without going to Australia. Uh, that's pretty impressive. How you can win a lottery, you know, without visiting a place is kind of amazing. So I call them the something for nothing type frauds where 
you know, I get a chance of getting something that, you know, if I really look at it, it really doesn't make sense. Uh, I'm the Prince of Nigeria. I want to give you $60 million if you give me $4,000. The types of frauds we've been seeing recently, I call the do your job emails. So it's an established vendor that you usually make payments with who sends an email to you saying, hey, by the way, we changed bank accounts. Can you now send it to this bank account? An employee sends an email saying, I'm going through a divorce. I need to, you know, I need to change my bank account where my pay is going from this account to this account. Probably the best thing you can do, I have right in my hand, is, is a phone to pick up and say, hey, listen, did that really happen? And I know it's it's an extra step, but it's really important that you take that extra step. Uh, and not rely on email uh, because the emails that we're seeing look like they're coming from the person, okay, uh, who's employed in your company. One of the big type of frauds that we've been seeing is a boss telling an employee to wire a certain amount of money. And as you know, I'm going to be out, you know, for the rest of the day, we'll talk about it at five o'clock, but I need to get this out as quickly as possible. Anytime you see quick, that, that should be a red flag. Uh, understand that it's probably best to take a couple minutes to understand the requests and pick up the phone. So, so any other questions, uh, Andrew? Super. So let's move on to about uh, other ideas in terms of what we can do to prevent cyber incidents. One of the things is establish written policies and procedures. I'm gonna add another line on there as well and periodically review them. It's great to have a policy and procedure written and then put away, but you wanna go in there every couple months, every six months and understand what the policy was and update it. Because as time goes on, there are new threats that emerge and you really wanna keep an eye of the threats that are emerging so that you're on top of the game because fraud unfortunately does change and the types and, and the, the rationale for getting in there will change every couple months. So keep an eye of what, what'll happen. Uh, rotate roles of employees periodically. I think this was a lesson that we uh, learned during COVID-19 is that, you know, it's good to have people who understand other people's roles and rotating them will help not only train in case there's a, a, there's a, a sickness or someone's out or someone leaves the position, but it also keeps people in a situation where you have different roles where people can look over each other's shoulders uh, and sort of use dual control because what they're doing is other people are entering uh, the payment cycle. Vendor management policy, understand who you're working with and their capabilities. Uh, and then we talk about something called authorization limits. So if you're a business, you know, one of the things we strongly recommend is, is the whole concept of dual control, where you have two employees, they're constantly working together to ensure control. Dual control in its essence keeps honest people honest because what it does is it has an accountability where, you know, if I'm signing a check, I'm not reconciling the checking account. Uh, if I'm have the ability to process an ACH or a wire, someone else has to approve it. And it's important that that someone else actually is present and takes a look at it. When we look at the last two, the wire transfers and ACH originations, probably the best way to help, you know, stop a fraud is right there when someone questions it and says, hey, does this make sense or not? So dual control, having two people present is very important in helping stop fraud. Now, what can the bank bring to the table uh, and what products and services can we help with protecting fraud? Uh, we have a, a number of array of products to be able to help with online banking. And the first thing is obviously online banking. Once again, it's a great idea to check your account first thing in the morning. It's very easy. Uh, we have an ability to download an app with your business that you can check first thing in the morning and pick up your, your phone on the way to Dunkin' Donuts. So keep an eye on what's going on and question the transactions that don't make sense. The little voice in your, in your head that says, wait a minute, this is out of order, listen to it and then follow up and try to understand what happened with that transaction. 
In addition, it'll also help your business in that you're keeping an eye on your cash flow. Reduced paper-based product. Uh, once again, I'm going to go to the to the, the boomer generation. Uh, paper is uh, something that can be backed up because storage is cheap. So electronifying payments is probably a good thing to do. And it's a good use of your time to be able to say, you know, we don't have this paper laying around that has the ability to do, the ability to, uh, to be a victim of fraud. We'll talk a little about oh. check positive pay and ACH. John, I have another question for you. Sure, Andrew. Yes. Um, what can I do to rotate roles or implement dual controls if we are a very small company? And, and that's, that's a good question. Uh, and dual control, and this is why it makes, you know, any advice we have, it really has to be customizable to your company. So if you have an accounting department with 20 people, it's relatively easy to rot you know, rotate roles and enforce dual control. If it's yourself and a bookkeeper, uh, that's where it gets tricky. What you want to do is as a basis, first off, make sure anyone who is check writing is not the one who's reconciling the account. Second thing is with wire and ACH transactions, have someone else review transactions before they go out the door and questions question any transaction that doesn't make sense. And then third, it's always be a skeptic. Uh, the, old, the old quote from Ronald Reagan, trust but verify. If you're the owner of the company, you're allowing someone access into your account. So what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you're doing your due diligence, not to sort of look over someone, but to ensure control because you need to know what's going on. Uh, besides that, Megan, do you have any other suggestions that you can uh, you can offer at this time? No, you covered it very well. Thank you. Super, thanks. So, uh, so we talk about check and ACH positive pay. These are services that the bank does offer. Uh, that is the ability for it's a double check in terms, no pun intended, for any items that process through the account. So, with check positive pay, you will send us a file of the checks that you issue. And then we'll check them as the checks clear through the Fed. So it is the ability to detect if, let's say, for example, check number 123 that was payable for $100 is altered to $1,000. And it'll show us an exception first thing in the morning. So check positive pay helps on the check side. ACH positive pay will help uh, with any ACHs. We're seeing a lot of fraud where someone will pay their Comcast bill using Comcast using your checking account. So you have the ability to block and filter ACH originators and have the ability to say, well, something like the IRS, they're going to get their money anyway. Uh, you, can, you can whitelist them so any payment can, will process to a situation where anything over a certain limit I wanna take a look at uh, to actually blocking them totally. Our lockbox is an, a solution that actually during a pandemic has really become uh, a second look. And that's when you send your checks to a PO box and then the, the bank actually will convert the checks, deposit them, and then send a, a copy to you, okay? Uh, other products that we do offer is, is really a commercial card program where you're paying card and not cash. But the idea is that you're enforcing dual control and you're segregating the duties on account even if it's a two person operation, if you have an owner and a bookkeeper, it's always important as the owner that you're verifying what's going through and that you're aware of what's, what's going on in your company. And finally, try to get away from cash. Uh, and I know a lot of particularly small businesses like cash, but when you think about it, the large companies that actually have accounting departments that do labor motion studies, they're actually going away from cash and going to cards, figuring that the merchant fee, it's actually less, it's more efficient to pay the merchant fee than it is to handle and worry about cash going through the organization. So that's, that's kind of the idea of, you know, products that we offer, but I kind of like to turn it over at this point to Megan to talk about information technology controls and things that you can do on the cyber side to help prevent fraud. Megan? Thanks, John. Before I get started, Andrew, are there any questions? Uh, 
No okay. other questions. Thank you. So this slide lists a few of the IT controls that should be present in your companies to prevent a cyber attack. And it's not a comprehensive list, and I'm not gonna go through all of them, um, but there are many other technology systems and controls that can be implemented to help prevent a cyber attack. But again, it all depends on your systems and your controls. So as we noted earlier, we cannot tell you the perfect password setting for your company, but we strongly recommend utilizing complex passwords, enabling multi-factor wherever you can, and even using biometrics on some of your high-risk systems. So if you're unfamiliar with multi-factor authentication, this is an authentication that requires at least two of the following, something you know, something you have, and something you are. So an example would be logging into your network with a username and password, and then receiving a one-time code to your phone. Another area that we recommend that John already covered is periodic user access reviews. We find these are extremely important because we, there is turnover at every company, and you wanna make sure not only are there people that have access to your system, current employees, but do they actually have the right access they need? And even when you implement a new system and you're working with vendors, you wanna make sure that everyone has the right access they need at that time, but sometimes it's temporary. So we recommend doing at least an annual review, if not every six months, reviewing who has access to all of your systems and what kind of access do they have. And that really follows the least privileged methodology. We also recommend you only store and maintain information you actually need, as John already discussed, and make sure you back up that data and store it securely. So in the unfortunate incident where you are a victim of ransomware, it is better to throw out the technology and use good backups and start over and fresh. And again, that would be really recommendations from a third party, but it's always good to have a clean backup ready that makes the process a lot easier. And again, I, I can't not take this opportunity to mention one more time, do not process any transactions based on an email, whether it's from a third party like a vendor or from an internal person. It is extremely easy to spoof emails, to compromise emails, and the best situation is always to call the person at a known good number. Now I will hand it back to John, who will discuss some of the ways to detect an incident. And before we move on, Andrew, is there a question? Yes, um, all these controls look very complex and I'm not an IT person. Do you recommend working with an IT specialist to help set up our systems? That may make sense based on a company, depending on the size and the resources available. Third parties can be very helpful to your infrastructure, but also to test it on an ongoing basis to make sure everything is still in place that you would expect to have there. All right, so now John, I'll hand it back to you for talking about how to detect an incident. Sure, and, and, and I kind of want to pick up on that to some extent too. Third parties are having a second set of eyes going through your business is extremely helpful. Uh, particularly for a smaller company, a lot of times you get caught up in the day-to-day, -day, the, you know, I, I got to make the cash register ring, that you don't take a step back. And that's totally understandable. Uh, using third parties or professionals, whether it's an accountant, an insurance broker, a good IT specialist, to take a look at what you're doing uh, can not only help prevent it, it can also detect the cyber incident because they're coming in periodically taking a look at what you're doing. So when we look at annual reviews or audits of financial re you know, records, uh, having a good CPA or, or financial professional, uh, an enrolled agent, uh, come through your books and take a look at what you're doing and say, you know, this is a good idea or this is, this is an area you can, you can improve. It's really important to listen to them and sort of understand that, you know, not only are you vulnerable on, you know, the financial front, uh, you're also, you know, vulnerable on a technology front. So you want to keep an, an idea of you know, what you're doing and how you can do better uh, by using third parties and understand that you, know, you, you understand that you're not the, the expert, but there are experts out there that can help you with what you're looking to do. Uh, regularly conduct account reconcilements. I can't you know, 
I, I can't you know, speak more of the importance of this. Uh, please reconcile your bank account. You'd be surprised, okay? The faster we're aware of a fraud or an incident, not only can we help recover the money or potentially help do something about it, uh, but we can also prevent it in the future. So it's really important to understand what transactions are going through your business and why are they going through your business? And a quick way to do that is on a, balance, a budget to actual performance. If you use any of the softwares like QuickBooks and you start with the budget at the beginning of the year, and if something is out of line, you can always identify it and take a further look. Probably the best thing you can do, you know, in detecting this is that little voice or that gut feel that's saying, hey, there's something going on with my business that I don't totally understand. I really want to take a look. You really want to listen to that voice in your, in your mind. So we go to the observations and that's that little voice. There's something in this that doesn't make sense. And I'm going to take a, a minute, okay, just to further clarify what's going on. For example, employees that take vacations or never take vacations, that should be something that sort of is a red flag. Uh, is it a situation where, you know, they're, they're able to take great vacations or are you the one who's funding that great vacation? Or are they never taking vacations because they're trying to cover something up? You always want to be a little cynical and a little, you know, a little paranoid about, you know, the money that you keep in your organization because you want to safeguard it. You don't want it to, you know, cloud how you operate or, you know, be a situation where it becomes a, a, a drudgery. But trust but verify, I think, is probably the best thing to, the way to put that. You always want to trust someone, but you want to make sure that you're questioning, does this make sense or not? When you're getting phone calls or mails or other, you know, from employees that have nothing to do with their jobs, they should raise a red flag. We talked about access logs. We have an audit for feature within online banking uh, that is an administrator. You can see what they're do, what what different users are doing when they're transacting business. Take a look at that periodically because what that does is it, it lets people know that you're paying attention as part of good housekeeping of running a business. Uh, and then two of the things talking about what Megan does. Any new vendor set up for accounts payable or changes in vendor payment information, call them on a phone that you know works, not on the email, but on the actual number that you've contacted in their past in the past, just to verify. Uh, once again, this is the phone that what everyone has on their, you know, that has the ability to pick up a quick phone call will verify whether it's legitimate or not. It's really important because unfortunately we've seen this happen more and more. A couple of other things you can do, review your credit reports. You have a right to a free credit, the three credit report agencies and you get one a year, which means every four months you can get a free credit report. And then consider placing a, an alert or freeze or a block on your credit report. And you can do this for free. If you go to the ftc.gov, they have more information in the procedure to, to do that. Uh, there are some other websites out there that try to sign you up for service, but go to ftc.gov for more information in terms of looking at your credit report to see if someone's taking your credit profile and is using it uh, to, to charge things that you're not getting the benefit of. And then once again, alerts. We offer alerts and it's, it, it's critical that, you know, that you know as quickly as possible. And with alerts, it helps you to say, hey, listen, there's a transaction that may or may not make sense. Uh, and we want to alert you to this to just take a look at it because it doesn't make a lot of sense. What do you think? And if it's a situation where you have an employee who's out in Idaho and they're charging gas, great, no problem. But it's something you should sort of investigate to say, hey, that's out of the norm. That's out of the norm. Let me take a look at, at what's going on. And then finally, going back to my analogy, uh, yes, you can, you know, you can drive your car, you can have two hands on the wheels, you can be focused, you can not listen to the radio, and you could still get in an accident. Uh, that's why we wear seatbelts. And a good insurance broker will sit down and talk to you about different insurance products that they have to offer, uh, not as a control, but it could save your entity. 
when we look at a six figure hit to the balance sheet, I mean, it is substantial and not many customers, you know, could, you know, could survive a hit like that. When we talk about insurance, we're really talking about risk management. What are the, what, are, what can hurt my business and what can I do to mitigate those risks? So when you sit there and talk to your insurance professional, make sure you have a good, honest, you know, conversation and lead with what are the risks that I should be worried about that I'm not. And that's the value a lot of them can bring to the table because they'll let you know. Andrew, do you have any, any other questions that, that I can answer before we continue? Yes, I do. What do I do if I find something that doesn't belong on your credit report? And that, that's a good question. And it depends on obviously what it is. Uh, the credit rating agencies, the credit bureaus have a procedure uh, to dispute it. So it depends on what type, uh, what type is out there. Uh, so go right directly to the credit bureau that's actually reporting the incident. Megan, do you have anything to add on that? I would say the same thing. Uh, and then, like you said, depending on the company, you may reach out, but filing first with the credit bureau is very important to starting the process. Super. Okay. I'd All like right. to turn you over to America to talk about recovering from a cyber incident. Thank you. So once you have identified that you're a victim, or unfortunately you've been notified that you're a victim, there is a lot of communication that needs to occur depending on the type of incident. So hopefully you already have an incident response program in place that lists out the communications required so you don't have to worry about that while you're dealing with an incident. We really recommend that you have contact information for third parties ready to go, and you may wanna have some on retainer depending on the incident and what your risk tolerance is. So this is again where someone asked earlier, you know, should we involve third parties? This is a case where you'd wanna have a third party involved because incident response is very time consuming. There's a lot of different pieces. Again, the notifications are important. So we wanna make sure also that you're contacting your banks as soon as possible. As we said, an ACH or a wire, once that is gone, it is gone. But if you contact us as soon as possible, we can start the process to try and recover it. And we do work with law enforcement. There's never any guarantee. And usually the funds are already gone by the time someone reports it to us. So when you're doing your training with employees, we strongly recommend that you encourage your employees to report incidents as soon as possible. This is hard because usually it's because they made a mistake and they don't wanna call out their mistake, but try and incorporate that into your program as you're doing training to really encourage incident reporting because the timing will make all the difference. And there are other things here, again, depending on the type of incident, you may have to notify regulators, law enforcement, it really depends on your business and the type of incident that occurs. So we have covered quite a bit today and we wanna make sure we left some time, but we have a, a few takeaways here. So we've summarized the themes and reminders and the most important thing is to implement the best preventative controls that you can based on your company, your risk tolerance, and your resources. But be ready to detect and recover from an incident because it really can happen to anyone. On the next slide, and this will be shared later, we do have some references for you to look at. Um, they have some great information. And you may want to start following certain people in the security industry just to keep up to date with some of this information. And now we will open it up to questions. Andrew, are there any questions in the queue? No, not at this time. Megan and John, thank you so much for your insight and opening our eyes to cyber issues that are going on out there. And also a thank you to Andrew Duncan and Courtney Raddy as well for their help in putting this presentation together. We hope you all have- uh, Rob, quick question. Are we yes. gonna be able to have, are we gonna, uh, how would uh, per people, uh, participants get copies of the presentation? We will, we will upload the presentation uh, to our website that Courtney is working on right now, John. Thank you, yep. Sure. I, I do have a question, everyone. 
Are the passwords generated by my computer good to use? Um, I can try and field that one um, without knowing your computer and system. It's hard to say, but that is a great example of vendor management where you want to look at what product did you buy? Um, what are their settings? What are their privacy settings, especially because they could be saving copies of those passwords somewhere that someone could see. Um, so you really want to look at the settings to make sure that you have not just accepted their default settings, but actually implemented the complexity that you want to use. And again, security is always a balance. So it has to be something you can remember without writing it down or putting it somewhere that others can see. This wasn't really a question, but someone just said, I will now secure cyber crime policy with a smiley. So good job, guys. Yes, we, we that, this is helpful. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's, you know, it, we're in this together. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, the bank doesn't want, you know, wants to do right by our customers. And, you know, we, we really all want to work collaboratively to help minimize the threat of cybercrime, uh, just like anything else, we're in this together. And the closer we work together, uh, I think the better the better off we'll all be. That's it so far. Great. As we're looking for more questions, there'll be a brief survey coming out in the next few days. Please watch your emails. It's a seven question survey to help us sort of form their, our business leadership series going forward. Please just take a couple minutes to give us your thoughts and, and inspiration as well. That being said, be safe, be healthy, enjoy the snow, and we'll, we'll see you shortly. <laughs>